thank you for coming out on such a lousy night, weather-wise. Uh, we tried to prepare a good program here with, uh, in conjunction with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, which is based in New York. Uh, they do, this is the uh, sixth year they have done this program, and up in, this is, but this is the first time anybody in Cleveland, and certainly then anybody at Case, has, has been part of this, and we hope to do this annually down the road. Uh, we had hoped for a bigger crowd. I think we would have had it if the weather wasn't so terrible. So for all of you who have come, we thank you for coming. And what we will do now in the next hour, the webcast comes on at 8, uh, Professor Stephen Feldman from Weatherhead will talk about U.S.-China uh, business relations. He has a forthcoming book. What's the title? Trouble in the Middle. Trouble in the Middle. And I had the honor of reading some of the chapters and giving some of my own little advice. And I'm looking forward to this book being published in January, February, March, whenever. Uh, and so I'm going to turn this over to Professor Feldman from the Weatherhead School. And Steve, take, take it away. Thank you, Paul. How's that? Is that working? OK. Well, thank you all for coming on this rainy night. Rainy and windy. I'm going to talk about uh, American-Chinese business relations. Uh, over the last six years, I carried out research on ethical and cultural issues in American-Chinese business relations. Tonight, I will talk about one part of this research on cultural misunderstanding and corruption in business-to-business -business relations. My data comes from interviews with American executives in Cleveland, Chinese executives in Shanghai, visits to American operations in Shanghai, and I'll use one data point from teaching Chinese business students at a university in Shanghai. My presentation will use quotes from executives, followed by my commentary on what the executives said. These quotes should be seen as representing themes in my broader research. I will first present the American quotes, then the Chinese. The quotes will certainly be open to other interpretations than the ones I give. And perhaps, if we have enough time, we can get into some other viewpoints during the question period. My book tells a story of two great cultures, one in the midst of enormous change, trying to come to terms with each other. It is a story of cultural conflict, misunderstanding, and significant challenges. The first theme, rulelessness in China. And here's the quote. The quote comes from the president of China operations for a Fortune 500 company. And this is, this is his quote. Chinese culture is 5,000 years old, so they must have some ethics. But it appears to me as if they do not follow any rules. It's like crossing the street. Did you ever try crossing the street in Shanghai? You could get killed. They don't obey any rules. A senior Chinese executive told me I would understand China when I learned how to cross the street. You must look in every direction. End of quote. That's Mr. BD1, BD for Business Diary. So that wasn't an interview. That was a visit to his uh, headquarters in Shanghai. He was walking around with me, and he said this. Uh, here's my comment on it. This executive has worked in many parts of the world. His, his comment that the Chinese do not follow any rules, despite the great age of Chinese society, is essential. He views China not as a country in the midst of extensive social change, but one that exists in a condition of chaos. The crossing the street symbol stresses the danger in the Chinese business environment. To protect oneself, one must look for danger in every direction. This executive implies that the Chinese are not comprehensible. Their behavior is not rational or trustworthy. And again, so that's representative of a pattern. Not every executive would say that kind of ish, uh, points, but uh, it was a pattern in my data. Next theme, 
China as, quote, the Wild West. And here's the quote. The 90s was like the Wild West. Anything could happen. In China, it's unregulated. It's pure capitalism. Our capitalism has formed over centuries. China had no history of capitalism. Enron is classic Chinese. It's more typical for China. End of quote. Mr. AM9. And this is a vice president uh, for marketing at a large Cleveland company. My comment. The Wild West symbol is culturally richer than the China as ruleless symbol. It brings to mind a chain of images of cowboys, gunfights, lawlessness, hardship, and self-reliance. It adds to the rulelessness motif, the hardened individualism of the American frontier. Some American executives experience the Chinese business environment as consisting of rugged individuals who potentially must fight or flee to protect their plans and property. With business relations lacking regulation by a consistent application of the rule of law, some American executives experience the Chinese in themselves as cowboys. Mr. AM9 describes China as like the Wild West in that it is pure capitalism. Like Mr. BD1, who described Chinese business as ruleless, Mr. AM9 puts his perspective in historical terms. American capitalism is old having formed over centuries, whereas Chinese capitalism is new. Historically, however, this is not true. Chinese capitalism is not new. But the more relevant and ironic point is that the relatively young American nation is seen as old, while the ancient Chinese civilization is seen as young. The reversal is telling, casting the Chinese as inferior to or behind the Americans. Indeed, Mr. BD-1 and Mr. AM-9 are both saying that since the Chinese do not play by American rules, they have no rules. Both offer a historical explanation for this conclusion, but neither portrays Chinese history accurately. The Americanization of Chinese history shows Americans needing to see China in their own shadow, as not measuring up to what some Americans see as universal values of freedom, democracy, and markets. Mr. AM9 makes a second reversal in his comments that Enron is more Chinese than American. He places American corruption in the American past, in the Wild West, or in China, where he puts Enron. Based on an assumption that China is corrupt and America is not, Mr. AM9 is trying to make sense of his experience in China but he needs to purify himself to do so. This reversal shows the discomfort some American executives experience while doing business in China, suggesting that they are involved in business practices they feel the need to deny. Next theme, misunderstanding Chinese gift giving. Here's the quote. I'm concerned about the local Chinese practice of gifts. In the US, if a supplier asks me to go to a baseball game, I ask myself if going will affect my decision in business later on. The Chinese do not have this thought process. End of quote. Mr. AM9. Mr. AM9 claims the Chinese do not reflect on the business significance of gift giving. In reality, however, the Chinese thought process about gifts is highly sophisticated and complex. In particular, gift giving is related to respect and face, group membership, reciprocity, status, and long-term relationships. Given the Chinese tradition of gift giving, it seems their experience of it is much less instrumental than that of the Americans, though there is evidence that instrumentality is an increasing aspect of Chinese gift giving. There is a subcontext in the gift example Mr. AM9 chooses, tickets to a baseball game. Baseball is, after all, an American competitive sport with many distinctive rules and rituals. But it is unclear exactly what thought process Mr. AM9 thinks the Chinese are missing when it comes to gift giving. Presumably, Americans too give gifts for business advantage. But Mr. AM9 believes these gifts are customarily at arm's length or only indirectly related to a business decision 
while he thinks Chinese gifts are directly related to such a decision and as such are unethical. To the extent that this is true, of course, it represents a breakdown in Chinese culture and ethics. That Chinese culture and ethics are under considerable stress is certainly true. Mr. AM9 worries that his Chinese employees might be accept accepting gifts for their own benefit rather than that of the company. Mr. AM9 is a high-level executive. He has more to gain from company success than do low-level Chinese employees. He knows how baseball is played. It's a team sport. He has succeeded in the American team system. Most Chinese, in contrast, do not see themselves as part of a team system. They see immediate individual benefits, and it makes sense to them to take them. They're living in the Chinese system, where opportunities have rather suddenly become plentiful, and from their perspective, could just as suddenly disappear. They are not missing a thought process. They are living in a different social context. Mr. AM9 does not understand this social context. He sees inadequate moral judgment. This disinclination to understand the other in his own terms makes working with different cultures more difficult. Next theme, middlemen pay bribes. Here's the quote. Our company uses middlemen of one kind or another for export, import, and sales to the domestic market. And basically, these middlemen pay bribes. Do we care? No, because the middleman is its own legal entity. End of quote, Mr. BD2. Americans have come to China to do business and make money. So they try to find a way to get the job done. Mr. BD2 takes a common American position. The law is the only standard. This despite the fact that Mr. BD2's company has extensive formal and informal ethical standards, one of which, promulgated both formally and informally, is that the company does not pay bribes because it has ethical standards. For all this talk, this company's talk about ethics, its ethics is to avoid violating the law. As long as the law is not violated, executives are free to do business in China, probably anywhere. I have another quote under this same theme. Here it is. All foreign companies say they don't pay bribes, but they sell to an agent who sells it to the customer with a bribe. Corporate headquarters does not know they do it. The company is clean. Somebody has knowledge, but there is no paper trail. I was in an expat training seminar. 40% of the participants said they use brokers or agents. End of quote, Mr. AM28. So even though, my comment, so even though American executives rationalize third party bribe paying in terms of its legality, they still keep the practice hidden from superiors. Clearly, if they did not think the practice was wrong, they would have no reason to keep it hidden. Indeed, they go to great lengths to hide the practice. James McGregor reports that contracts with middlemen are restricted, restricted to one copy print, printed in black ink on red paper so it cannot be photocopied. The fact that they participate indirectly in bribe paying, even though they know it is wrong, is a compromise in the face of an intractable problem. To the extent that companies are not working to remove themselves from these compromises, the compromises are unethical because they violate, in my view, the company's own rules. Next theme, corruption. Chinese employees in American firms. We're still on the American quotes. I think this is the last one. Here's the quote. In China, things are different. We call it TICB. This is China, baby. I fired a Chinese woman last month because she changed our company bank account to another bank where her husband works. We got a better deal at the new bank. The husband got a huge bonus, but it involved a conflict of interest, and it was against company policy. 
She said she did not understand that she did anything wrong, even though she had been told the policy. Her boss actually had to approve the change, but she got the boss's assistance to chop the stamp, stamp it, uh, the change. This showed me she was, doing the, she was doing something wrong. She knew she was doing something wrong, so I fired her, Mr. BD1. So again, that was the president for China of this big company. A uh, quick point for me. I spoke with the boss. So that was the president who did the firing. Uh, the accountant, the Chinese accountant, reported to the chief uh, financial officer. He's coming in a second here. Yeah. My comment, is, I spoke with the boss, that, that, the guy I'll get to, the chief financial officer, uh, whose chop was used in the above story. And he added a few details. So here's now a second quote on this one story. I know the woman, and she is honest. She has high integrity. She did not think what she did was wrong. All she had to do was disclose that her husband worked at the, at the other bank, but she chose not to. She had been trained by the company. She should have known. End of quote, Mr. BD2. My comment. These two comments illustrate the dilemmas American executives face in managing Chinese employees. Mr. BD1 says the Chinese accountant was fired for inappropriately uh, approving the transfer. But Mr. BD2 says she was fired for not disclosing that her husband worked at the bank. It appears she was not fired for inappropriately approving the transfer because it involved Mr. BD2's chop, and he certainly would have known if his chop had been used inappropriately. Mr. BD2 wanted to protect his employee who he thought had high integrity, but did not because she did not disclose her husband's relationship to the bank. Mr. BD1 is Mr. BD2's boss. He made the firing decision and justified it by citing the accountant's alleged deceptive use of the CHOP. Otherwise, headquarters back in Northeast Ohio might raise questions about who else was responsible for this serious lapse. It appears Mr. BD1 and Mr. BD2 were protecting themselves. Mr. BD2 says the accountant did not know she was doing anything wrong, but should have because of her training. If indeed the accountant was honest and had made a mistake while working in a foreign company, this can be seen as a gray area. Additional training possibly could have removed the potential for more mistakes. Mr. BD1, however, afraid of either looking bad or not following company procedures, felt he had best fire her. This was a case of culture conflict. The Chinese accountant was living in two different worlds. The American, where conflict of interest is forbidden, and the Chinese, where a wife's support of her husband is morally required. Firing an honest employee for a first offense where there is no loss and cultural conflict is involved seems harsh to me. The dilemma Mr. BD1 faced was that the impersonalism of the American rules put him at risk if he did not fire her. In effect, the accountant acted to meet her cultural responsibility. Mr. BD1 fired her to meet his. Importantly, they both would have had different problems had the accountant not transferred the bank account or Mr. BD1 not fired her for it. OK, that's the end of the Chinese executives. Let me move on. I mean, the American executives. Let me move on uh, to the Chinese. First theme, corruption and careers. Here's a quote. In a Chinese company, salary could be low, maybe 3,000 RMB, about $400 a month. But the real money could be higher by manipulating expense reports. Chinese employees may be proud of how they get money from different channels. This is a culture. Most people are doing it. End of quote. Mr. CH1. Mr. CH1, interestingly, now works for an American company. He says that Americans taught him, and he now counsels others, to take a long-term view of one's career. Cheating on expense reports is not really worth it when compared with the risk to long-term career success. In other words, one should avoid cheating, not because it is wrong, but because it is not profitable. It, doesn't, it does not maximize long-term financial benefit. 
I think uh, Mr. C.H. one's pulling my leg here. Uh, but let me continue with his, uh, with my comments. Mr. C.H. one is 30 years old. The American company he work for, works for offered him a long-term career plan, but like many upwardly mobile Chinese, he quit anyway for a higher paying job. He was lured back when the company promised additional long-term opportunities, but then quit again 18 months later after the company moved him to the, uh, to the US at considerable expense. Chinese employees working for Chinese companies usually do not have these opportunities. So even if Mr. CH1 is right that not thinking in the long term about their private sector careers leads the Chinese into corruption, it is also true that they have no experience that would lead them to think in the long term. In a business environment experiencing explosive growth, many Chinese go after the most lucrative opportunities, even if it means changing jobs every few months or even weeks. In this sense, then, corruption and turnover are related. They both reflect a disinclination to make long-term career commitments, which in turn reflects a society unsure of not only its future, but also its past. Free to some extent from total dependency, many Chinese have stepped into a moral void. Next theme, the Cultural Revolution and the next generation. Here's the quote. In old times, people were not able to get an education, especially during the Cultural Revolution. Now it's too late to teach them everything. They want to make up for their life by working hard and making money every way, no matter how indecent or bad that way is. Small part of the people that generation, now 41 to 51. They believe it not fair that they were born at that time. They want to catch up. They feel they deserve more from life. They do everything they can to get it. End of quote. Ms. CH 14. The Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1976, left a whole generation of Chinese demoralized, destitute, and desperate to make up for their losses in life any way they could. In addition, not all Chinese trust the reforms. Some want to make as much money as they can as fast as they can. So if the government cuts back on economic liberalization, they will have capitalized on the opportunity before the window closes. American executives typically misunderstand the Chinese because of their lack of historical knowledge and empathy. An important point to add is that in this troubled generation, are the parents of the young employees that do the intense job hopping. It is unlikely that the younger generation was counseled early in life by their elders to pass up opportunities in favor of long-term commitments. Long-term commitments assume a stable social environment that the previous generation never experienced. Furthermore, almost all of my Chinese students knew little about the Cultural Revolution. Hence, not only were they encouraged to seize opportunity, but they lacked any historical knowledge that could have led them to reflect on their careers and their parents' advice differently. The loss of historical memory, enforced by the party to maintain its legitimacy and control over the population, is a key characteristic of Chinese culture. Next theme, public and private, private bribery. Here's the quote. It would not be uncommon for middle manage managers at hire to ask for bribes. It is against company policy, and they would lose their jobs if caught. But they are careful to ask for bribes only from people in their group, people they can trust. They check you out, take you to dinner, and see if you are thinking like them. It would not be uncommon for public companies trading on the Chinese stock exchanges to have middle managers asking for bribes. End of quote. Ms. CH30. In contrast to these comments on private sector bribery, several executives said bribery in government is systemic and thus cannot be stopped. In many cases, there's no one to whom to report the bribe because either the whole organization is in on it 
or those requesting the bribe are capable of severe retaliation or both. The higher example, however, suggests that private sector bribery is not systemic, is therefore less prevalent than government bribery, though the comparison is relative because Ms. CH30 says bribery would not be uncommon among large Chinese companies. Of course, it must be remembered that many large Chinese companies are governed, are, or are uh, large Chinese government are government owned or partly government owned. This fact, combined with extensive government regulation of business, results in intertwining of corruption in business and in government. In any case, the 2009 anti-bribery law has leveled the playing field to some extent, forcing bribe seeking underground as government officials, like their private sector, private counterparts seek bribes only with caution. Next quote, next theme, a case of idealism. Here's the quote. Some business people bribe government to get better channels, but my company wants to show a quality product. If we are only successful through relationships, friends will look down on you. You will not be, res be respected by society. Maybe your family will still uh, accept you. Bribery is not a good way for me. 50% of the people are like me. Many of my friends in business are successful. The more successful they are, the more bribery they use. Bribery creates many opportunities. For me, money is not the most important thing. One should show dignity in making money. I want to live gracefully. We want customers to respect us. We want to prove our value. End of quote. Ms. CH32. My comment. When Ms. CH32 was a student leader during the Tiananmen Square conflict, nine of her student followers were killed. It is likely she went through a re-education process at the hands of the government. It is hard to think that these experiences did not have a profound effect on a 20-year-old student. At 20 years old, Ms. CH32 was idealistic in politics. At 40, she is idealistic in business. The first idealism sought to change the political system. The second seeks to live gracefully. This change in idealistic ends is a move from external control to internal control. Ms. CH32 says 50% of Chinese business people are like her. Whether that number is right or not, it is certainly true that Tiananmen the Cultural Revolution, when Ms. CH32 was separated from her parents as a child and lived for years with inadequate food and clothing, and an untold number of lesser events affected the outlook and character of many of the new entrepreneurs. For them, corruption, whether in business or government, is far from their deepest fear. Their deepest fear is of government brutality. We have seen that personal relations dominate communal relations in China. Accordingly, Ms. CH32 mentions that she will still be respected, she would still be respected by her family if she was successful through bribery. Her experience, however, has led her to go beyond personalism. She wants to do the right, do right by society. Communism attacked family bonds, encouraging citizens to make their primary attachment to the state. Ms. CH32's concern for society is not the result of capitalism. Capitalism cultivates self-interest. But possibly the residue of early communist idealism, the re-education experience, or both. It does suggest that a capitalist role can neatly fit inside the communist endgame. The question is still open. How far will the Communist Party allow capitalism to cultivate individualism in China? The case of Ms. CH32 is one possibility. OK, I'm going to stop there. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Thank you. Where I'm going to try to pick up on this. Um, What is the 
future now of China, given this kind of history that he's gone through. Um, there's a lot of talk today uh, in scholarship, people who study China, about China's rise uh, economically, militarily, socially, and influence in international relations. If you go to Amazon.com and type in the phrase, the rise of China, which I did a few days ago, I got 6,061 books listed with that name in the title. China's on the rise. Well, after 33 years of working in China, and uh, I'm stuck here, um, studying China and living there, I've come to learn one thing, and that is, in China, you're always waiting for this to drop. So the question has to be raised, is China rising? And I would maintain that in some ways it is, and in other ways it is not. Um, China's goal, overall goal, is not to create a, uh, a market economy, but to develop and create a rich and powerful modern country while keeping control uh, by the Communist Party. This means keeping a lid on social change, uh, a la Hu Jintao's harmonious society. That was his philosophy 10 years ago. Well, how do you change an economy to such an extent without social change? It's impossible, especially when you have a generational change. You simply don't keep a lid on change. So that is what I mean by the catch-22s on the sheet that I put on your chair. Uh, these are catch-22s that, if you know what a catch-22 is, you have to do this, but if you do this, you can't do this. It, it just blocks you in. And these are catch-22s, or nearly so, that um, gives us a view of China as maybe not rising the way we think it is. Um, indeed, if you look, scholars study each one of these issues individually, and it looks as though uh, China has a big challenge ahead of them. But when you put them in a large, uh, together, in a list, and you see this, each one a large uh, potential difficulty, and you see them all together, then you begin to see this is a bigger job than we think it is. And so today, as we are speaking here tonight, China is in, uh, the Communist Party is in a fight for its own legitimacy, uh, which creates uh, some problems. Now, with an increasingly restive population, a population that has real complaints, muddling through may not be an option, as it has been, in the last 20 or 30 years. I put another uh, sheet on your, on your chair about what's going on right now in Ningbo. Um, thousands of people in the last four days, including today, um, marched in the street to block an $8.8 .8 billion <coughs> expansion of a chemical plant for fear that this would create environmental harm in their city. Uh, the government backed down, the city backed down and said, we're not going to do it. But these protesters are now demanding that the mayor resign from his office. So all of these domestic problems, that Ningbo is just one example, but all of these domestic problems that I've cited here indicate that China will have to change in one fashion or another. And here's the difficulty, either political change will occur to have China become more open, or political change will occur for China to become more repressive. Now, this is the choice between two basic factions within the Communist Party. One is more liberal. They're looking at Singapore, which is run by one, one party, the People's Action Party. They have held power since 1965. One party, but yet there are free elections, there are open elections, there are other parties involved, 
although they never gain. Last year, one party gained four seats out of 87 in the, in the parliament. So they, these people look at Singapore. The other faction uh, is represented by Wu Bang Wo's uh, chairman of the National People's Congress, five no policy, no multiple party system, no checks and balances with a bicameral legislature, no federal system, no pluralism in ideology, and no privatization uh, totally. So these are the choices. Now, what does this mean for U.S.-China relations? I have no clue as to what the ambassador is going to talk about. I don't know what the questions will be uh, put to him. But po current political talk in the United States about getting tough on China is really, at one level, just talk. But what happens in China if we do so-called get tough on China has implications for Chinese and American relations. In an absence of an ideology, when nationalism is the, tea, the key for China, a get tough position by the United States would give support for the policy positions of the more conservative faction. We have to be on guard against the United States. So to set in motion steps that could lead to a trade war would do damage not only to the economies of both country, and it would slow growth and increase unemployment. The major political consequences for both countries are severe if we do that. What does China respect, though? They respect that when you get tough with them, when they are breaking the rules that they themselves have agreed to. World Trade Organization comes to mind here. The Obama administration has pursued Chinese uh, infringements on those rules by taking them to the WTO, uh, filing suit against them. And China gives in when the WTO says, yes, China, you have broken the rules. So where this leaves us then is in a situation that China is <clears throat> about to change in one fashion or another. It will become more open than we ever thought it would. Singapore, despite being run by a single party, is quite open, although it's strict. You don't spit on the sidewalk or chew gum and spit it out. Um, they'll either go that way or they will become more repressive. And this has implications for how the United States reacts to China and what we do with China. If we get tough, we might push the Chinese party to favor those who are more conservative and Wu Bang Guo's group of the five no's. If we nurture them along in a political way, I'm talking politics here, not business, in a political way, then we might see China become more open as new leaders come to the fore. So with that, I'll close, and we'll throw it open to questions for either uh, Professor Feldman or me. You might want to stand here. So any question? <clears throat> About sometime this month or last month, the future leader of China disappeared for two weeks. Why? <clears throat> well, they said that he disappeared because uh, he might have been ill, might have had a mild heart attack, all kinds of excuses. My personal view is that they were in the midst of trying to line up who's going to take the various positions in the Standing Committee of the Politburo, and they, they reached a disagreement. And this was uh, Mr. Xi's way of saying he doesn't like what Mr. Hu is doing and lining up his supporters. Uh, so I'm just going to disappear for a while, and let's see how you can live with that. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But it's clearly wrapped up in this transition of leadership from one uh, administration to another. Any other questions? <clears throat> what does that tell us about uh, that, that he would disappear like that? Uh, what does that tell us about uh, China's government? That it is unsure of itself, 
Uh, China entered 2012 with the high hopes of having a smooth transition, of institutionalizing this transition that started in 1992 and repeated itself in 2002. So let's do this again. We've selected the top two leaders, the premier for the government and the general secretary of the uh, Communist Party. Well, this year has been anything but smooth. It has been, the party has been beset by scandal. Uh, Bo Xi Lai was kicked out of the party, not only kicked out of the Politburo, but kicked out of the party for corruption. He was one that was being viewed as possibly uh, getting into the standing committee, and <clears throat> he was kicked out in part because his wife killed a business associate from Britain. She confessed. She has to serve 15 years in prison. We don't know what he's going to serve yet. He's been now uh, convicted, not convicted, charged with a, a whole variety of crimes. So this was a major embarrassment for this smooth transition. Well, if you have different factions within the party, they, you have these factions, which are more than the two that I mentioned, uh, they crisscross each other. So how do you come up with the need for a new premier, a new general secretary, and s nine members, seven of nine members additional on the standing committee of the Politburo? How do you choose who's going to be what? So there's a lot of horseplay going on. And part of the problem is that it has been anything but smooth. Typically, when they, <clears throat> when they, uh, they meet every summer at Beidai Ha. It's a sea, sea coast uh, resort. And they f flesh out who's going to get what post, who's going to do what job. And then they immediately announce, once they get back to Beijing or wherever, they announce when the uh, party congress will be. Well, they didn't announce this party congress, which starts on November 8th, a week from Friday, until mid-October. So they couldn't even decide when to meet because these political issues were not settled. And that's what's been going on. Um, <clears throat> these protests in Ningbo, which are just one example of several protests going on across China, is a major embarrassment to the party. And this is why a lot of people think that the party is worried about its own political legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And if you read the whole article, I just gave a few snippets to get it on one page. The people in Ningbo were telling reporters that we don't trust the government. We don't trust the party. So that's where we stand today. And with maybe 150,000 major protests going on every year over a variety of issues that impact people's lives, you end up with uh, this kind of skittish political system or skittish political atmosphere. So, yes, sir. Japan has been skirmishing verbally so far over these islands between Japan and China. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? What's going on? It's not the islands. If you saw a picture of these islands, they're about the size of this room. There's a handful of them. Uh, they're uninhabited. It's the oil underneath and the natural gas. It's resources. Uh, this is in the East China Sea. China also claims the entire South China Sea. So it has similar skirmishes, but they don't blow up like this one has, between with the Philippines, with Vietnam, with Brunei and Indonesia. All of those countries border the South China Sea. And it isn't, there is an international agreement that says you're allowed so many miles outside of your uh, border, that's yours, and then there's another set of mileage that becomes, uh, I forget what they're called, they're commercial areas for development of oil and gas underneath, and that you can claim that. But China claims the entire South China Sea and, in fact, has made it a core national interest. 
There are only two other core national interests, Taiwan and Tibet. So this is something that core means they won't negotiate. So what you have here, why this blew up with Japan, and why did the authorities in China allow this to, to continue, all these raw anti-Japanese demonstrations and destruction of Japanese property, why did they let this happen? Well, it's nationalism. It's the only ideology left. So what you end up with is uh, a whole series of skirmishes between China and the Japanese in China. And as, as we know, there's no love lost between the Chinese and the Japanese. So it doesn't happen so much with the Philippines or Vietnamese who are in, in China or their property. But it certainly will happen with Japan. And the government allowed these demonstrations to go on for two weeks. And then they said stop. So it's a way to exercise your nationalism. It's a way to exercise the only ideology that seems to be left in mainland China. So that's my take on it. How this will be settled, shade your thought, who knows? Any other questions? Meyer, you always have a lot of questions in this small crowd. I've been saving them up. How independent are the seven members of the standing committee relative to the leader, or, are they, or is the leader all powerful over no, them? No, the leader's not all powerful. The seven members, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, the new general secretary, he will be, uh, probably has a certain amount of those who are in his corner. And that's what they're fighting about. How many get, how many should we let him have? Now, he has something that Hu Jintao and, and all outgoing leaders like to hang on to power for as long as they can. So Hu Jintao will remain chairman of the military, Central Military Commission. That's how they retain power for a while, or influence, not really power. Well, Xi Jinping is the son of a famous a military general who fought the Civil War and the Revolution. And he's got all the power. The army stands behind him. Uh, he's, a, he's not a uh, person who is flamboyant or anything like that. He looks kind of sheepish, but he's got a lot of military backing. So how many of these people get named to the Central Standing Committee, which we don't know who they are yet, uh, are in his corner is, that's what they're fighting about right now. And they haven't even, indi there's, you could go through a lot of possibility, possibilities, but who's, who's to say? So that's the problem. Don't know. And they, um, so the leadership presents the standing committee once they right. the Congress? Right. They'll have, after the Congress ad approves them, they'll all be standing there in a row like this, all nine, there's seven new ones because the, the new premier and the new general secretary are already on it. Seven have to re resign or retire. They'll have all nine standing there, and they'll say who they are, and we'll be guessing at who's backing who. And they hope for a smooth transition, so they're not going to say anything out of the ordinary. But if they're all reformers and not conservatives, then there's going to be a change. But if they're all conservatives and not reformers, then there will be a change. Something's going to change in China. There's no question about it. Anybody else? How are we on time here? We have our little clock, Petey? Uh, yeah, but I mean, there was a countdown clock for the, from the committee. I don't see it. Well, anyway, at eight, we have 10 minutes or less. It's true, oh. Thank you. It's true that the, the meeting that you're talking about that uh, hasn't yet been decided exactly when well, it, it starts they, a week from Friday. Yeah, okay, then they stand across as you just yeah, described. Yeah, when they're done, they all stand And they're all buddy, 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 and everybody's pulling No, they're just standing there individually. Yeah, Only but there's uh, everything's just one. beautiful now, and everybody's happy. Right. There's really nothing that happens at that meeting, is there? I mean, everything. Other than electing these guys. Yeah, but they, and it's all been decided before the well, meeting. Well, it's been that? decided at the Congress behind closed doors. They yeah. will decide the thrust of the next five years. They're, these are five-year terms. They typically take two terms. They'll, they'll, mm. 
approve the thrust that the party wants to go to. And so the question becomes, do we really start looking at political reform, or do we retrench? And that's what's at stake now. Uh, the new, uh, the guy who will be general secretary, Xi Jinping, entertained in Beijing, Li Kuan Yew, who was the, basically the original founder of the People's Action Party and Singapore's government since 1965. He wants to hear how they did it. Well, if China goes to a Singapore model, then it's a different country entirely. Uh, the Communist Party sort of rises up and stands in the background, and then everything is done with privatization and the way Singapore operates. So that's what we're waiting for, some decisions to be made. Anybody else? You want to take a break for a few minutes and then come back to the... Sure, unless there's any other questions. Janet has one. Well, um, do you know, do you have any sense of what China thinks of, um, you know, the presidential candidates and others sort of using it as a synonym for bad things, you know, like we yeah. don't want to be like China or, you know, and using well, it, I don't know. They don't like China being the whipping boy in this election by either candidate. What about Donald Trump? <laughs> Bring money, you know. Uh, they're worried about Romney because he says he'll get tough. Now, this is an, in, an interesting question because Trump, uh, Romney says, on day one, I will declare China a currency manipulator. What does that do? That only starts negotiations between China and the United States to talk about currency relations and how China actually does. They do manipulate their currency. But these negotiations have been going on since 2005, and they have resulted in a, a rise of China's currency by some almost 30%. When I was going to China all the time, it was always 8.26 renminbi per dollar. Today, it's 6.25 or 2.4, just the other day. So that's about 30% rise in China's currency. They're not going to change the mechanism by which they determine this. That's what people are upset about, that they're manipulating the currency by not letting it freely flow. So what you, what you end up with then, if, if Romney gets elected and he does this on day one, among the many million things he'll do on day one, uh, you just say, we're going to negotiate. Now, what happens if he decides, or somebody decides, or Congress decides, to put on tariffs on China. You think China's going to sit there and, and not put tariffs on our goods? The problem is that China is not our largest export market, but it is the fastest growing export market for American products, typically machine tools, agricultural products, uh, generators, a whole variety of high-end uh, machinery. Well, if we put tariffs on Chinese goods because we think they're manipulating the currency, they will put tariffs on our goods. And what you will see is a slowdown in economic growth on the part of the chi Chinese economy, a slowdown in our economic growth, and the end result will be increasing unemployment in both countries. To me, the only way that, and I think if the Chinese have an opinion, it's that stick with Obama because what he does, he doesn't wail against this except in the, uh, against China except in the campaign. What he does is hold China's toes to the fire by breaking the rules that China has agreed to. That's what China respects. But don't bash us over the head with something coming out of the blue. So I, who they really favor, I think it's Obama. But because they're done, Romney's an unknown entity and uh, they don't know what he'll do. I, I think what Romney wants, well, that, there, I won't go there, so never mind. <laughs>